Alzheimer's is a, a modern health crisis. People just don't realize how big of a deal this is. And you said it, mm -hmm. it's a triple. The number of what people with Alzheimer's is going to triple by what, 2030? 2030, yeah. It's less than 10 years. So. Yeah, it's it's crazy. I mean, today, if you make it to the age of 85, you have a 50% chance of being diagnosed. Wow. Yeah, it's wow. crazy. It's crazy. But there are things that you can do. And, you know, I've dedicated my life really to helping people, you know, separate fact from fiction and, and help avert these kinds of conditions. We don't have all the answers about Alzheimer's mm -hmm. disease, but we know essentially uh, a few salient tenets about how to live in a way that um, nurtures the health of our brains. Yeah. And so that's really what my work has been What's about. Max. What up? Welcome back to the show, man. Thanks for having me. It's been a weird, I don't know, like m couple months in science. Mm. Some crazy revelations. One in particular, this is why I invited you back on, has to do with Alzheimer's. And I know this is a, a subject that's near and dear to you um, and also one that you're super well-versed in. You're like my go-to person when it comes to brain health. So maybe kind of explain what's happened. What are these revelations what are the around new Alzheimer's? Developments? Yeah, why are things getting so shaken up? So essentially what happened was it uh, was revealed that a seminal 2006 paper published in the journal Nature was built on fraudulent data. And this what this basically, this revelation has done is it's overturned almost a century um, worth of uh, effort at this point in terms of looking for a cure for Alzheimer's, a pharmaceutical cure for Alzheimer's disease. Now, that's not to say that all of the research performed is worthless. That's, that's definitely not the case. But the prevailing hypothesis that has guided drug discovery with regard to Alzheimer's disease over the past um, century has been what's called the amyloid hypothesis. And this hypothesis basically stipulates that Amyloid beta, which is a protein that we all produce in our brains, and as we age, tends to form these insoluble plaques, is the cause for Alzheimer's disease. And it began basically in 1906 when Alois Alzheimer, for whom the disease is named, saw these plaques in the brain of a cadaver. And he, his working theory was that these plaques were the cause of the disease. Also in tandem with the plaques, you see widespread neuronal death. There's marked brain shrinkage um, in, in late stage Alzheimer's disease uh, and memory deficits, which are obvious. Everybody, anybody who's ever had a loved one with the disease um, will be familiar with that. Uh, but he wasn't able to name amyloid beta at the time. He just saw these plaques, kind of like the plaque on your teeth surrounding neurons, mm -hmm. right, in our, in our brain, in the brain of this uh, cadaver. It wasn't until the 80s where they discovered, or they named rather, amyloid beta. They came up with a name for this protein that they saw, again, that we all produce that is able to, um, in some form, these, these, aggregate, these aggregate plaques. And so the plaques really became the focus for drug discovery with the, uh, with the idea that if we can remove these plaques from the brain or prevent the brain from accumulating these plaques, that we will then have a cure for Alzheimer's disease, which is a condition that affects 5 million people in the U.S. alone, and that number is expected to triple by the year 2030. So this is a, a condition that's that's rapidly exploding. But there are a few sort of plot holes that um, from day one really were uh, dissonant with this, uh, with this notion of amyloid being causative in Alzheimer's disease. And the primary one is that many older people have amyloid beta in their brains but they don't have the cognitive de deficits that are associated with Alzheimer's disease. Oh, wow. Right. Were you privy to this before all this came out before? Were you kind of already? Yes, 100%. Because okay. though the amyloid hypothesis directs the vast majority of uh, drug discovery um, funds and research, it's not that there are other neurologists and neuroscientists who are going down other paths. For example, um, there's the metabolic origin theory of, of Alzheimer's disease, that um, Alzheimer's disease really is, is a, a problem of uh, glucose hypometabolism in the brain. So an underutilization and a, a, de a deficit in the ability of the brain to create um, ATP from sugar. And this so is where like, the type three diabetes comes yeah, from. Exactly. Which was coined by a, a legend of a researcher named Suzanne Delamonte at Brown University, but she's not the only one. Um, and so, you know, one of my mentors uh, who was at Cornell for many years and he's now at, uh, 
FAU, Dr. Richard Isaacson. I mean, he was another, you know, one of these neurologists, practicing neurologists who didn't, who just didn't buy that that amyloid was the cause for, for Alzheimer's disease. Again, because people have it in their brains that don't show these cognitive deficits, right? Now, now Max, does everybody who has Alzheimer's have these plaques? Yes. Okay, so if you have Alzheimer's, you have these plaques. Right. But then there are people with these plaques that don't that have don't any have symptoms. Them. Right, but the, okay. but the central idea is that the plaques are probably a symptom, mm. not the cause. Got it. Similar to the way that cholesterol builds up in our arteries, mm. right? Is cholesterol the cause of atherosclerosis or is cholesterol being deposited in our arteries due to some other factor, some other variable, right? Exactly. Whether it's inflammation yeah. or oxidation of, for example, the fatty acids that are being tugged around our bodies by these various lipoproteins, for example. So it's there certainly at the scene of the crime, but is it, is it, is it suspect number one, that's been the sort of guiding hypothesis, but they were never able to connect these amyloid plaques with memory impairment. They were never able to do that until this seminal paper was published in 2006 in the journal Nature by Sylvain Lesny. So this is the one that said, here's a silver bullet. We proved the hypothesis. We proved that amyloid, when injected into young mice, dramatically impairs their cognition, mm -hmm. their memories. So that was the missing link. <clears throat> that was the missing link. And at that time in 2006, when this paper came out, there was waning interest in the amyloid hypothesis. It was still the, it was still the dominant um, direction that industry was going. And a lot of these like massive Alzheimer's focused organizations, I won't name any of them, but are deeply, in, I mean, everybody was so deeply invested financially in this hypothesis, There's right? Industries around it, right? Industries, yeah. Um, but nonetheless, by uh, 2006, it was becoming clear that it was, or it was a, 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 at least starting to become clear that this was the wrong direction because drug trials, Alzheimer's drug trials, as anybody knows who's, who's working in this field, have a, a dismal um, success rate. 99.6% of Alzheimer's drug trials fail, right? So you can only fail so many times before people want to look elsewhere for solutions, Let, right? Let's back up for a second. So yeah. so are these drugs that, because the, the theory is, oh, it's these plaques. So let's create a drug that effectively Blocks reduces these plaques. Yeah. Oh, here, this does that. Yeah. Then they put it on trial like, oh man, no symptom improvement. Is that what was happening? That's yeah. exactly what happened. And, and actually a very controversial drug called Aduhelmer, aducanumab, was recently greenlit by the FDA, and it was highly controversial. What these drugs essentially do is they're antibodies that, that mark amyloid plaques for clearing by the body's immune system. So okay. it essentially creates like an inflammatory response in the brain, hmm. which then helps to reduce because it trains our own immune systems to attack these plaques and let's clear these plaques, right? Um, but what they found in this um, aducanumab trial which was the which was the last before this a drug hasn't been approved for Alzheimer's disease for thirteen something years, um, but aducanumab recently got the um, the green light, and it was highly controversial. It did succeed in reducing plaques in the plaque burden in the brain, but it didn't improve cognition. It didn't improve anything with any clinical value, other than serve as sort of uh, confirmation bias mm -hmm. that we can, with a drug, reduce the brain's plaque burden, right? It's like a statin almost, right? For the almost, like a, almost like a statin, right? right. Um, so this drug, actually, when it was um, being uh, assessed by the FDA, they put together this panel of 11 people. Eight of the people on this panel, this internal panel at the FDA, told the FDA that they shouldn't, that, that, that ethically, in terms of the efficacy, this drug should not be approved. Two people withheld comment and only one person said, yeah, let's go ahead and approve it. But the FDA ended up approving it and three people resigned afterwards. Wow. And again, this drug reduces plaque in the brain, sure, but it doesn't actually improve any of the meaningful indi you know, indices that we want to improve for a patient with Alzheimer's disease, right? And in fact, people who saw this reduction in plaque burden, there was a 35% side effect rate. So 35% of the patients Holy saw, saw brain swelling. Jesus. And about half of those had bleeding associated with the brain swelling. Now, so did they, nothing good, yeah. right? Yeah. Now, did they apply this hypothesis to other 
uh, neurodegenerative diseases, or was this the main focus is Alzheimer's where they found the plaque? Well, Alzheimer's disease is, is the most common form of dementia. So all the money goes into Alzheimer's disease, but there's overlapping features depend with, with, with other neurodegenerative conditions. Um, you know, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, for example, they're both, they're, they're called proteopathies. So they both involve these misfolded proteins in Alzheimer's. It's primarily, um, amyloid beta along with tau. And then in Parkinson's disease, you get another uh, protein called alpha synuclein. So they're, they're different, but they're similar they They all have neuroinflammation in common. They all have oxidative stress in common. Um, but you know, the most, co the, the more, the diseases that are more common get the most funds. And so the, the, Alzheimer's disease was, was squarely focus. in the target. Mm -hmm. So my question is, how did it get green? Why would it get approved? If Money it train already going or what? I mean, yeah, I mean, that's that, the, the way that's, I mean, you have in science, these fiercely territorial, obstinate personalities that, I mean, have you ever, have you guys ever heard the saying science advances one funeral at a time? Mm. <laughs> it's no, because it's because like we expect science to evolve naturally and be driven by curiosity and a desire to to augment the human condition, right? And make life better for people. But but so, first of all, science is an industry and it's a tool that's wielded by people that have, I mean, oftentimes serious personality defects. I mean, if you guys spend any time on nutrition Twitter, I mean, some of these, oh, yeah. you know, <laughs> like it's, it's clear that some of these personalities are, are highly toxic mm. and those exist in academia. And so when you're published in a paper like nature, which for a scientist is like winning the Academy Awards, yeah, it's right? A big deal. Mm. Yeah. It's a huge deal. And also when you come from a lab, for example, this guy, Sylvain Lesney, he was the young, um, university of Minnesota researcher who, who was basically found to have created this fraudulent data, which we haven't even gotten into yet, but he was working in the lab of a woman named Karen Ash, who had this incredible pedigree. And so scientists, you know, especially when you have celebrity in the field, they, they don't want people, there's groupthink, mm -hmm. just like in every industry, you know, it's always human. They're always humans. I'd also be, human. I'd also be curious too, of what, what drugs were already in the works before this fraudulent study came to do, do we, has anything been released around that? Like, do we know like all, so it was what you said, 1986, when was it? The, stu the study? Uh, 2006, 2006 when, was, yeah. the latest one. was the, was the one that was fraudulent. Yeah. So were, were there like drugs that were ready to go? Like as soon as that study got published and pushed through, do you, do you know? They, or like that conveniently came out like right or after. Or drugs that were already out that were already supposed to supposedly. Yeah, I sense. believe, I, I'm not sure the timeline of the two most commonly prescribed drugs um, that are out now for Alzheimer's disease, but all they are are biochemical band-aids. Like one is the, you know, there's donapezil and uh, Nemenda, and one works by increasing the amount of acetylcholine in the brain, which is a neurotransmitter mm -hmm. involved in learning and memory. And the other one is a, it's called Nemenda. It basically modulates the NMDA receptor, which is a glutamate receptor. Um, what you see in the brains of people with Alzheimer's disease is, is excitotoxicity. So sort of an imbalance of gluta, yeah. glutamate and GABA. And so those two drugs are usually prescribed in tandem, but they're just they're just biochemical yeah. band-aids. It's like L-DOPA for Parkinson's. Exactly. Or, yeah, it's like L-DOPA for Parkinson's. What's up, everybody? Ooh, you're going to love this giveaway. Check this out. By the way, this is a great episode uh, with Max Luvier. It's a controversial one. You won't want to miss this one. Anyway, here's the giveaway. Map Split and Maps Powerlift, both together, you can win for free. By the way, here's why I put those together. We've put together a whole bunch of different bundles, small bundles, two and three program bundles, and we've put them all on sale. This sale ends uh, on the 14th of this month, and every bundle, every single bundle is $99.99. That's it. So every bundle you find at mapsaugust.com, $99.99, and you could do, you know, like I said, Maps Split and Powerlift is one of them, which I'm going to give away, and I'll explain how you can win that in just a second. We have Maps Performance and Maps Aesthetic. We have Maps Starter and Maps Anabolic. Like a whole bunch of bundles, all of them are only $99.99. Okay, here's how you can win the bundle that I just told you about, which is Powerlift and Split. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel. Turn on notifications. If we like your comment, we'll notify you in the comment section, and then you win that bundle. And once again, for everybody else, if you want to take advantage of this promotion that's ending on the 14th, go to mapsaugust.com. All right, here comes the show. Okay, so so let's talk about this fraudulent study. How did they how did this how did they figure out that it was fraudulent? What, what happened? So, <clears throat> all studies are subject 
when they're published in, in major medical journals, especially a journal like Science or Nature, which is where this, this study was published, they all undergo this process of peer review, right? But scientists aren't looking with a fine tooth comb at imagery, right? They're not like image sleuths. Mm. And the kind of data that was fudged um, deliberately in this paper was a, f a way of presenting data called the Western blot which is basically like these images that depending on how um, bold this blot appears, you, there's a stronger presence of a certain protein oh, okay. um, that's being illustrated essentially. Now this, the whistleblower who, who identified this data as being um, fraudulent, he had already garnered a bit of credibility because he was very critical of the aducanumab drug that I mentioned earlier. He was very critical of this drug because again, it didn't improve clinical markers like like quality of life, memory, cognition, anything like that, but it was associated with these awful side effects like brain swelling, right? So he was already hypercritical of that and he was working on another, um, another case for this other pharmaceutical company. And over the course of his research, he was spending a lot of time on um, PubPeer or PeerPub. It's like this uh, website where it's basically it crowdsources peer review. It's like oh. crowd review essentially for scientific cool. literature. And a lot of people were talking about this paper, which he saw, but they hadn't really kind of done the deep dive that he was able to do using image software, where he found essentially that some of these blots in this Western blot were literally co copy and pasted. Wow. Um, like yeah. purposefully fake. Wow. Purposely, yeah, purposely fake. Like identical blots to others that were in the paper. They were like digital artifacts that were clearly, you know, if you like zoom in and like turn up the contrast, like do a little bit of color manipulation. So, you know, when like a, a paper is submitted for peer review, they're not doing that mm -hmm. to the data. They're looking at the numbers, right. you know, they're reading the methodology. They're like reading, you know, reading the conclusions and things like that. They're not like looking at the actual imagery. Um, and that's how this data was presented in this paper that showed that this specific sort of subtype of amyloid beta called A beta star 56 was directly responsible for cognitive deficits in the young rats that it was injected into. What turned out to be the case is that other scientists since 2006 weren't really able to find this, um, this amyloid beta subtype, but it was just accepted as truth, A, because it was published in nature because it had this like pedigree with mm -hmm. this with the scientist and his mentor and that nobody everybody just accepted what was presented by the western blot as as face value but it turns out it was completely fraudulent and nonetheless this paper went on to really renew interest in this in this amyloid hypothesis do we do we know hmm. why the, what the motive was? Was it just uh, like you know, that's prestige, why I asked about the fame? that's why I asked the drug thing there. I feel like there had to have been like some, some money motivation. Yeah, are there any speculation as to why they they made a fraudulent study that way? Well, I think I mean I think it it very clearly has to do with um, with money. I mean, mm. uh, there's three billion dollars that go into into Alzheimer's research every year from the NIH, and a huge portion of that goes into like amyloid amyloid associated research. Yeah. Even, and again, some of the biggest um, like Alzheimer's advocacy organization, in air quotes, advocacy organizations um, put money through that sort of pipeline. And I, and I have my own experience with that too. Oh, the other thing, the other, the other um, problem with this, it's not just that it derailed, look, you know, looking elsewhere for a, for a viable cure or treatment for Alzheimer's disease for the past 16 years. But any other voice, scientist, um, physician, what have you, that would that would bring up an alternate sort of viewpoint would be ridiculed by the quote unquote amyloid mafia, because all of these science were so they were so deeply invested, like their their hands were deep in the pockets of this hypothesis. Yeah. So know? okay. So <clears throat> this is really interesting, and I know you have a personal experience. I want to go there. Uh, I want to go there in just a second. But just for for the listeners, you know, the way research works is you have a hypothesis or an idea. If it gets accepted, it's almost like a branch on a tree and that directs the next coming research. And the longer that's allowed to go on, if it's a wrong, if, if the first initial breakthrough study or whatever is wrong, the further away from the truth we end up going. So it's like you have something that can follow a path. It could go this way or it could go this way. And if this is the direction that it's going to go, it keeps going that way. And why it keeps going that way is because that's where you get the funding. Like, 
if I tried to get funding from the NIH for al you know Alzheimer's research, which they do a lot of funding for Alzheimer's, it's a big problem. But I said, hey, I have this uh, hypothesis that it has nothing to do with amyloid plaques. It has everything to do with, um, I don't know, I'll say, you know, make up something, right? Um, they're not going to give me any money. They're going to be like, why? We're not going to fund that because this is where, it look, this is the direction it looks like it's going. So we're going to give these people money. So everybody who's following along with that particular hypothesis, they're the ones that get the money and that's where all the studies go and that's where the drugs go. That's where the drug companies go because when you're a pharmaceutical company, if you're trying to raise money from investors, investors are going to look at what you're trying to do and they're going to say, well, I, you know, I want to develop a drug that, that prevents the buildup of amyloid plaques. Ah, I'm putting money there or I'm going to develop a drug that is totally novel and different. Eh, that's a really risky. I don't think I'm going to give you any money. So that's so it continued for that long, and for that long we've been totally misguided. Now I, I, I want to talk about your experience. Well, but also, you know, Amal Alzheimer's disease is a condition that begins in the brain thirty to forty years before the presentation of symptoms. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's so, crazy. so the idea that you're going to be able to have a drug right that comes along and undoes decades worth of damage. Yeah, right. good point. And we don't know all of the, and I, I could talk about some of the potential reasons for the damage. But the idea that we're going to be able to develop some some monotherapy that's going to come along and undo decades worth of damage, arrogant. it's it's a pipe dream. Yeah. It's arrogant, right? But nonetheless, this idea that amyloid, because in the brains of people with 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 Alzheimer's disease, it's just plausible enough to get doctors and scientists to to buy in, right? And if they can come up with a drug that is going to, that, that can potentially reduce the amyloid burden. I mean, you know, drugs have a, a run where before they, before they're able to be uh, generic, you know, they make tons and tons and tons of money and all the investors. I mean, if you see any, whenever there's any good news of an amyloid drug or a, an Alzheimer's drug, the, whatever the, the pharmaceutical industry, if they're a public company, this, the stocks spike. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's a ton of money in it. Um, and, and, there's no money, as you mentioned, Sal, like in telling people to just, you know, perhaps eat a healthier diet or be right. more mindful of the air pollution that you're exposed to or exercise more. It's just not, it, it doesn't sell. Like you can't make, have a billion dollar exit or make shareholders happy with that kind of advice. Right. And yeah. Knowing that it's like 20 to 30 years, like, uh, uh, you know, if you go all the way back there and uh, is there any early detection signs or tests or anything like available to kind of. Uh, at least start to understand that this is something that, um, you know, is developing. Yeah. Great question. I mean, there are every once in a while, you'll see a new biomarker pop up. Um, there was one called IRS one that was a blood biomarker that correlated, uh, really tightly with, um, brain energy metabolism. I wrote about it in my first book, uh, genius foods, but I haven't really heard much on that. Um, since then, essentially there's been this resistance to acknowledge that we could potentially prevent Alzheimer's disease mm. because it runs counter to the doom and gloom funding pipeline. Mm. Right. Mm -hmm. And so when I first got started and I started uh, working on this documentary project, which I'm now very close to finishing, thankfully, um, I got a taste of that. There was actually a, uh, there was this guy, evil dude associated with one of these Alzheimer's, one of these totally benevol benevolent seeming Alzheimer's advocacy associations that came out, uh, against me and attacked my project um, because it went against this sort of amyloid hypothesis dogma of the time. And he went so far as to, um, he even wrote an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal and the headline is Misplaced Hopes uh, for Curing Alzheimer's Disease. Wow. Okay. So so let's talk about this documentary because th is that that's what piqued him to come after you? Yeah. Was the create, and you, it, so I've seen the trailer for this. It's, yeah, it's uh, amazingly powerful. Now you have a personal connection. We've had you on the show before talking about this, but yeah. your mom suffered from Alzheimer's at a young age and you were with her the whole time. And this is what motivated you to really go in this direction and, and why you do what you do. And this documentary was about that, that process. So he got wind of this and in the documentary, you talk about what, like, you know, th there's dietary stuff you could do exercise. Here's some other. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the, the idea that you can prevent uh, dementia with, you know, through, through diet and lifestyle and by the way, I'm not saying that we that we know everything that is that can prevent dementia in each person because once you've seen one case of dementia, you've seen one case of dementia. It's, it's possible that there different. are different causes for each person who ultimately develops develops that condition. But um, essentially, any any uh, 
I, I guess they felt threatened that any focus that you would take off of the necessity for a sort of cure, quote unquote cure, um, a pharmaceutical cure is, uh, is less, you know, is again, like less, it's going to be less good for the bottom line of that organization. So my documentary was all about prevention. My efforts have always been mm -hmm. about the prevention of dementia and cognitive decline and Alzheimer's disease through diet and lifestyle. Because again, this is a condition that begins in the brain decades before the presentation of symptoms. That's always been since day one mm -hmm. of me setting foot out into the health and wellness world, the prevention of dementia. Yeah, and now the, mm -hmm. you, you mentioned the am, the amyloid mafia. So this guy's part of it. Who, yes. Who else is part of it? And did you get, it was anybody else or has anybody else come after you or, or try to come after you for saying you could prevent this through lifestyle changes? Um, this was this was probably like the closest I've I flew to the sun with this with this one article and this <laughs> one guy. Um, but no, I mean, I, I could name certain scientists who I know that that generally do good work um, but, uh, but yeah, our, their whole careers have been, I mean, the thing is like in science, reputation is everything, mm. right? So if you're, again, science advances one funeral at a time, right? If reputation is everything and data comes out overturning what was previously, a, a, a prevailing dominant hypothesis about the etiology of a certain condition, and you've spent your whole career working on that, you're going to, you're going to fiercely defend it. Yeah. against all odds, right? And a lot of these guys have incredible pedigrees, like from Ivy League universities and the like. So you see some kid come in, right, trying to do a documentary on dementia as a condition that's potentially modulated by our diets and our lifestyles, right? And that's a threat. That's a threat because I can speak to the masses, oh, right? It's a direct shock usually, to their ego, man. Yeah. You, built your whole, you built your whole career off of something like that, like, and then that goes away. Like, yeah. that's a huge yeah. shot to the ego. But here's what I've seen. I've seen the tides turn. I mean, they're turning slowly, but surely, like when I first got started, you couldn't say dementia and prevention within the same sentence. That was like, mm. you'd get like tomatoes thrown at you. It was just that it just flew against, you know, everything that, that, that the neur neurological medical orthodoxy um, knew about Alzheimer's disease, that it was not a condition that you could prevent, treat or slow. Um, but as of, I mean, it was uh, 2020 published in the Lancet that the Lancet is one of the most prestigious medical journals mm -hmm. finally acknowledged that up to 40% or at least 40% of Alzheimer's cases, dementia cases are potentially preventable. They said literally in the Lancet, and I quote, the potential for prevention is high. And they listed all of the different risk factors. So, I mean, when it comes to Alzheimer's disease, you have what's called, you have two types of risk factors. You have your non-modifiable risk factors, right? I'm sure you guys can guess what those are. You have your, you have your age, you have your gender, and you have your genes, right? You can't modify any of those things, right? Yeah. But then you have this array, 12 non mod or, or rather modifiable risk factors. So the 12 modifiable risk factors, diet, sleep, exercise, yeah, all those things. Are you obese? Do you have hypertension? Are you, do you have, what's your education like, right? Um, do you, is, are you socially connected? Uh, what is, you know, are you, are you a type two diabetic? And as of 2020, they actually included um, three, uh, three new modifiable risk factors, one of which being air pollution, exposure to, to excessive air pollution, um, excessive drinking, and then there was one other one, I forgot it. But essentially, the bottom line is that you have, we all have risk factors that are modifiable, and that's the empowering story here, right? And about five of them, if I recall correctly, whether it was like BMI or hypertension, um, are mediated by diet. So diet plays a huge role in yep. terms of our brain health. Yeah, it's uh, the 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 diabetes connection is is pretty big, right? And the or or just the, your inability to process carbohydrates, sugar, or just your ins, you know being insensitive to insulin. That's a pretty big connection. Huge, yeah. If you have type two diabetes, your risk for developing Alzheimer's disease increases between two and fourfold. So it's it's a, it's massive. Yeah. Now I'm gonna ask you a personal question because this is really close for you. You you went through the process of what it's like to watch someone get treated for Alzheimer's through the medical community and it fail. When when that when this news came out, which is recent, that, hey, this was fraudulent, I mean, what was your reaction? How did you feel when you saw that? I mean, it my I went straight back to that Wall Street Journal article where my project was attacked. And this is a project that I've been working on for eight years. Like I've put so much of my blood, sweat, and tears into this, into this documentary. 
Um, and the documentary precedes my books. So I, st I got started working on this documentary back in 2014. And since then, because I had to make a living and I wasn't just going to sit idly on my hands as I waited for all the pieces to come into place to finish my documentary, I've written, you know, I've written three books, I've launched my podcast, et cetera. But this, this film is really like the, it, 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 um, engenders like why I do what I do. It's about my mom. My mom had a, a rare form of dementia called Lewy body dementia. It's a one in five dementia cases are attributable to Lewy body dementia. So, you know, I'm not holding my breath for the kind of research that we have on Alzheimer's disease, um, to come out with regard to Lewy body dementia anytime soon. But, um, what I've learned, you know, after years and years of year and years of immersing myself in this, in this research is that what's good for the brain is good for the brain. We don't have all the answers about, uh, Lewy body dementia. We don't have all the answers about Alzheimer's mm -hmm. disease, but we know essentially, uh, a few salient tenets about how to live in a way that um, nurtures the health of our brains. Yeah, and so that's really what my work has been What's, about. Wh why do you think we? Because I find this very interesting that we, if we talk about the heart, we consider the heart a part of the body. So it's like healthy body, healthy heart. But for, when it comes to the brain, although it's still a part of the body, just like the heart is, we because it houses the mind. We sometimes separate the two. Like we don't necessarily say, well, if you have a healthy body, you're more likely to have a healthy brain, therefore have a healthy mind. Why do you think that is? Well, I think part of it has to do with the fact that when you present to a physician with, you know, perhaps risk factors for cardiovascular disease, there are things that a cardiologist can do that will at least on paper make him happy, right? Mm -hmm. Like, if you present to a cardiologist and say your LDL is too high or whatever, they can put you on a reduced fat, reduced saturated fat specifically diet, and you can watch your LDL come down, right? If you have joint issues um, and you're eating an inflammatory diet, a pro-inflammatory diet, you can potentially clean up your diet and see your joint issues improve, right? You can eat in a certain way that obviously affects your body composition. You guys are experts at that. You talk about that all the time, right? But with the brain, it's not as simple, right? Like with the brain, we don't have as many biomarkers. Oh, true. You can't flex your brain in the mirror. <laughs> um, and, and and when you <laughs> present to a neurologist with, with any kind of brain condition, the tools in the toolbox are very limited. Um, so it's like, it's basically IQ tests and cognitive tests, and that's our metric. Essentially, but we, we have really good correlates. We know that the metabolic health of the body um, is crucially important when it comes to the metabolic health of the brain. They're tightly correlated. Mm -hmm. We know that cardiovascular health is really important with regards to the brain. The brain is fed blood, nutrients, and oxygen um, by this network of micro micro vessels that if you were to take out of your brain, out of your head and stack end to end, these these micro vessels would stretch 400 miles long. So we need to we need to nurture that that network um, of of micro vessels essentially, and 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 procuring good heart health is one way to is one way to do that. We have cognitive tests. Cognitive tests are okay. Um, we have various brain scans, but as I mentioned, I mean, it's futile to look for amyloid in your brain because I mean, as people age, they tend to accumulate amyloid and amyloid is actually, it's probably the same way that we produce cholesterol as a vital nutrient for mm -hmm. life, right? Amyloid is probably, probably, um, probably serves some kind of protective function, at least in the early, uh, at least early in life, right? They've done, um, studies at, uh, at, um, Harvard, where they've actually devised this technology where they can grow essentially brain cells in a lab dish. And they find that when exposed to the herpes virus, you see this upregulation of amyloid production mm. um, in, the, in the brain. So amyloid is like, it, it potentially serves a, an anti-inflammatory purpose, at least until the point where, where the buildup becomes overwhelming. Got it. And then the inflammation kind of like feeds back on itself. Just like the plaques on arteries. Uh, yeah. Some people will say they're put there to, to because there's inflammation and it's kind of bolstering and strengthening the artery. But then, of course, you get too much and then it blocks uh, things off. Yeah. It's been a really weird time in science because while this happened with Alzheimer's, which literally upended uh, the, just the prevailing thought. We have these, this paper that comes out that totally flips the serotonin model for depression on its head as well. Like that just came out and there's decades of medications and treatments completely based on this serotonin deficiency model for depression. And now they're like, no, that's not yeah. the case. Are, are you familiar with, with what's been happening with that? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, this, this paper that came out, it was an umbrella, umbrella meta-analysis and review. 
And basically what it found was that there's no good evidence um, that there is a chemical imbalance in the brains of people with depression, which I think is really empowering news, right? Because I think it could be tempting. It could be seductive to uh, think that you were, that your brain just is, you know, not working properly mm -hmm. when, when you're depressed, right? Or that you were born with a brain that just isn't, you know, isn't meant to be um, happy, for example. Now, what this review, and I think it's really important to, to mention this, what the review didn't look at was the efficacy of medication. So these medications do work for some. Yes. Right? I'm glad you said that. So that's super important. Yeah, because if you're on an SSRI and it's it's helped, don't go off of it. Absolutely. Of this this right. is just- this The is mechanism just doesn't matter. Yes. The mechanism okay. doesn't matter. The outcome is really what matters. Mm -hmm. And what research shows is that the efficacy of these medications really- um, depends on or is, is mediated rather by the severity of the depression and what the medica the medication seem to be most efficacious in people with more with increasing uh, severity of their mm -hmm. depression mm -hmm. unfortunately the medications are very widely prescribed and, and and over prescribed in fact and for people with mild to moderate um, which is the most common forms of depression it's the vast majority of people yeah. with depression right so for people with mild to moderate depression not much more effective than placebo um, and certainly, you know, likely not much, not more effective if at all than exercise, which yep. we know is a powerful antidepressant, yep. but they are certainly effective for, for some people, yep. um, for many people even. Um, but what this paper basically, um, showed us was that there really is no difference in terms of the serotonin level in the depressed person versus the quote unquote, not depressed person. They look in, they've compared cerebrospinal fluid, uh, serotonin levels, um, which admittedly is pretty hard to do. So there isn't a ton of research on this, but, um, in postmenopausal women, what they found was that among depressed women and non-depressed women, clinically depressed women and non-clinically depressed women, cerebrospinal levels of serotonin in CSF, not significantly different. Um, they've also done a number of studies over the years that are called, uh, serotonin depletion studies. Oh, yeah. Um, they use, there are different mechanisms to do this, but, uh, one, one way to do it is you basically feed somebody branched chain amino acids, which outcompete uh, tryptophan for entry into the brain. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so you can, tryptophan is the precursor to serotonin. And mm -hmm. so essentially what you're able to do, at least temporarily is to, uh, quote unquote, deplete the brain of serotonin. And it, that tends not to, um, cause depressive symptoms, right? Like if you're, if you take a BCAA supplement on an empty stomach, do you walk away depressed? No, no, you don't. So. Um, so they looked at, a, 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 you know, basically the breadth of available evidence measuring serotonin levels in clinically depressed people and controls. They also found in that that uh, the serotonin receptors, because they said, okay, maybe their, their receptors are downregulated. Yeah. They actually found that depressed people have slightly upregulated serotonin receptors. <laughs> yeah. Which is like the opposite, opposite yeah, the complete opposite of what you would expect. Right. Yeah. So based on, based on this review, they found that there is no, but you know, most, um, like any psychiatrist like worth their salt knew that, that this was not this, this, that this theory wasn't the sole guiding theory for depression. No, anyway, we had, we had a debated in, in junior college, uh, uh, in, in psychology class, because we knew way back then that the placebo effect was almost as effective as those drugs. Yeah. So, I mean, we, I feel like we've been, we've kind of known it. And the argument that we had a debate was, should we still prescribe it? Even though we know that the placebo effect is almost as equal. And the, uh, the prevailing answer by the class was like, yeah, we still should, because it's still helping a ton of people. Well, the side effects. Well, there's side effects. Yeah. The side effects are, are non-trivial, you know, like they, mm -hmm. They mess with your sex drive. Obesity. They, they can increase suicidality in some like wow. they're, yeah. Mm -hmm. They're, uh, they're no walk in the park. And so, and they're also difficult to come off of. And I have experienced personal anecdotal experience with this too. My mom, at the beginning of her disease, a psychiatrist thought that all of her symptoms were attributable to depression. There is a, there is a kind of, de uh, de like there is a complex of dementia that, uh, you can kind of observe in, in people who are severely depressed, it's called pseudo dementia, mm. but that's not what my mom had. But nonetheless, a psychiatrist put her on sertraline, which is like one of these SSRIs. And, um, she was on the drug until, until the end of her life. And it was impossible to come off of like impossible. You need to, you know, jump through all kinds of hoops to, to Oh, cause of withdrawal. Yeah. Cause of withdrawal. Holy cow. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, so I'm actually, I was, I'm listening to a book called the body keeps a score right now. It's a really, really good book. I've heard great things. Excellent book. And in the book, he talks about how like Prozac hits the market and it, it created a completely new industry yeah. in mental health. Whereas in before 90s. 
it was all talk therapy. And then all of a sudden there was like prescription therapy was, was the big thing. And I mean, just, I, I can't stress this enough, how much it changed the trajectory of investments and uh, of research because every, so much was built on that uh, theory that lots of money didn't go in other places because it all went to that. Again, you know, getting funding to develop a new SSRI after Prozac hit the market, like way easy to get that money compared to, hey, I have this idea for this other novel treatment. Like you're not going to get any money for that. Yeah. I mean, these drugs, they, they've they been shown to increase levels of BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factors, so they can help potentially, in air quotes, rewire the brain mm. if, if you have like old traumas and stuff. Like there there is a potential for that. Um, but uh, but no, I mean, in general, yeah, they, they do tend to be over-prescribed. That, that is a big problem. And there are other causes for depression. I mean, you could have something bad happen in your life yeah, and, <laughs> and, and feel it's normal to be depressed. There's the inflammatory cytokine model of depression, that inflammation can instigate depression um, in some. Their depression can potentially be uh, caused by a crappy diet. And we can see this in studies where they actually improve um, subjects with clinical depression, their diets. They get them off of junk food diets and they start, you know, getting them more on whole a whole foods um, dominant diet. And they see like remission, like like stark um, rates of remission in, in people just eating like whole foods, yeah. right? Yeah, Max. This, so here's here's why I think it's so part of the reason why it's so complex. And by the way, what you're saying, I mean, we were trainers for decades. I uh, I didn't. I never saw a single client not have a mood improvement mm -hmm. um, from exercising with me and changing the diet. Every single person I worked with that was consistent saw such an improvement that they would comment on it. Okay, that was everybody. That was just exercise and diet. It wasn't performing miracles. It was just traditional exercise and diet. But part of the reason why this is so challenging is it's 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 almost like pain. It's almost like dealing with pain, like physical pain. Like describe your pain. Where does it come from? And, and then it's your experience of the pain. That can make it, for some people, it can make it arousing. For other people, it could be you know terrifying, right? Mm. When you're talking about depression, like both two people could have the same... I guess, objective feeling, but then subjectively one person could perceive it differently. Maybe they feel more empowered or maybe there's meaning behind something and they don't perceive it as something terrible. They just happen to be, oh, that's John. He's just a little flat, but man, that guy's driven. And then you got this person over here who maybe feels physically the same, but their perception and their experience of how they feel is so different that for them, it's depressing crippling. and crippling. Yeah. And so how do you separate the two? That's that's the, the challenge. Because we're not just dealing with the brain. We're dealing with the mind um, and consciousness. Good luck. You know, that's why I find that, you know, so damn challenging. How do studies get funded? And why is it so hard to get some things funded and other things uh, not, not so hard? Like, how does that work? Yeah, I mean, I think you just have to follow the money trail. I mean, if the, it's easier to find money for a, a drug candidate if it's potentially patentable. Um, and, you know, we've certainly seen that with, I mean, when when uh, Prozac, I'm pretty sure is uh, generic at this point. Yeah. Most of these SSRIs are generic, right? But uh, there is, a, and I don't know the exact laws and, and rules, but at the beginning, a drug is able to be patented. And they, they're crazy expensive. Like, I mean, the, the Alzheimer's drug that we were talking about before, aducanumab, it's, it's insanely expensive. Thousands of dollars a pill or something yeah, like that, right? Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. And yeah, I mean, it's, you know, with regard to nutrition studies, I mean, like a lot of the nutrition research that we have actually comes from the industry. I talk about this a lot because, um, you know, we know, for example, that blueberries are very good for the brain. But blueberries are, I mean, we know this because the studies on blueberries are funded by one of these like blueberry producers. We know that <laughs> we know that dark chocolate is really good for the brain because most of the studies on dark chocolate, cocoa flavanols that we know support cardiovascular health and brain health are funded by Mars. Mm -hmm. I swear. So, you know, we can't we can't necessarily throw out all industry funded studies, right? Because if we're gonna throw out studies funded by one industry, we should throw out all of them. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cause let's, let's, let's talk about this. Cause this is a very yeah. challenging um, problem, right? Cause to I, navigate, I, yeah. I talked to my, okay. So I talked to a friend of ours, Lane Norton, somebody that we uh, love and sometimes disagree with, but um, oh, he's the guy's always, he's got his opinions and he tries to stay. He's, he's got good integrity uh, in, in my experience. And I sent him this paper. I sent you the same one. It was, it was in PubMed and somebody did an analysis of the, 
the uh, what was it? I think it was the Dietary uh, Guide of America. Yeah, Dietary Guide of America. Or, yeah, Dietary Guidelines for Americans. Yes, and this is an association that essentially dictates our dietary policy, influences regulation. Okay, so smart scientists. This association that that they're the ones that put forth our policy. Okay, so, so they went through and they looked for conflicts of interest, like strong conflicts of interest. Like, okay, could this person? Are they connected to this industry here and how connected are they and could that sway their decision? So it'd be like, you know, if I'm a, if I'm a Congress person passing legislation on a new, uh, you know, bill that's going to, you know, raise taxes on a product and then I go buy a competing product on the stock market. Like that's, that's conflict of interest, right? Yeah. Okay. 95% of the people <laughs> in this association had strong conflicts of interest or potential conflicts. So almost all of them mm -hmm. with the food and pharmaceutical industry. Now here's the challenge with that, but that that's, doesn't sound like a good thing. I don't think it is a good thing, but the challenge is how do we fix that? Because like when I talked to my friend Lane, I said, Hey dude, this is crazy. And he goes, it is. He goes, but I don't know what the solution is. And he goes, look, when I got funded, cause he did studies on leucine. He, his theory was that uh, leucine, um, you know, if you measure leucine, that'll tell you the quality of protein, essentially. I'm paraphrasing. And he's like, where was I going to go get funding for that? I wasn't going to get it from, uh, you know, plant food companies or he was, I had to go to the beef industry and the dairy industry, because if, if my reason, if my theory was correct, it would benefit them. So it's like, where do we like, how, is, do you have any ideas of how we could potentially eliminate these conflicts of interest and make it more? Cause I, I've been well, racking the hope my brain. Is that there's I, enough competing yeah. that, if you can't get it from one industry, you can get it from another industry, right? I don't know. Or or maybe fund, maybe fund uh, scientists. Because here's another thing that there's not much funding. Scientists who come out to duplicate or prove wrong studies. There's not much funding in that, right? Which For, is, that's what science is supposed to be doing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, how what is that, does what that, is that saying? It's, uh, it, it takes monumentally more effort to, to debunk something yeah. or to like debunk a lie than to create that lie yeah. from the, from the get-go. Yeah, I don't know. I don't have a I don't have a simple solution, but it really is a house of cards and it's very disheartening. And I'm not like a, you know, I think it's it's, you know, you got to be tricky. You don't want to sow skepticism when it comes to science because like science is really at its heart a method, mm -hmm. but the industry of science I think is is re has really, you know, it's it's really bad. Well, um, I just I think the the I mean, I don't know the answer to getting the studies funded, but for the consumer, for the average listener, I think this is the message that we've been trying to communicate so long on this show. I know you do the same thing too, is just that you have to kind of take everything with a grain of salt. You can't, mm -hmm. you just because some, just because some study says this, it doesn't make it the truth and yeah. the end all be all. And I think as consumers, we need to, it, it, okay, this now may point us in this direction, or this is interesting, but the, what I found with, and I, and you, I think you alluded to it earlier with the, the nutritionists on, on social media. I mean, that's, it's like you get this dogma around it. Like one study comes through and, and, and says something or proves a point, which probably was biased because somebody who funded it wanted that point to be proved. Now everybody latches onto it as it's the end all be all. And it's just not. Well, isn't part of the scientific method being able to replicate it? How often does, do these studies get replicated? Like, yeah, well, I mean, yeah, it's, there's what's called the primary literature, the secondary literature, but a lot of this like stuff that, you know, people argue about is like secondary, just like dreamed up, you know, in a boardroom somewhere and, and then somehow published like a good example of this that I um, talked about recently on social media was the Tufts University Food Compass. Did you guys see that? <laughs> yeah, dude. Um, no, I, yeah. Share, I, I, I retweeted it. Did you? Yeah, nice. you posted it. Yeah, 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 yeah. That one? Oh, explain it. It's, oh, it's so the, the, the food, it's a nutrient profiling system that was devised at uh, Tufts University by uh, a researcher who's done, he's a legit nutrition researcher. You know, I've, I've cited some of his, his previous work, but he was on uh, this team that assembled this nutrient profiling system that was then critiqued by a researcher uh, and others um, named Ty Beal et al., you know, put together this critique because when using this algorithm that they devised to score foods, to make it easier for consumers to identify what's healthy and what's not, and also for manufacturers to use to steer consumers towards healthier choices, when running um, a myriad of different food items through this, this algorithm, what they found was that 
really healthful nutrient dense foods like oh, I did see like this beef yeah. and eggs and whole milk were, we're on the, the bottom, bottom of the list yeah. and then at the top were like frosted mini wheats <laughs> and lucky charms what the hell and egg substitute because they're like fortified with shit and stuff. yeah well, it's just egg no it's because they use it right, in vegetable right. oil yeah. yeah that freaking wow. thing the food compass score so yeah he so basically this legit nutrition researcher whose work i i really quite like um published this critique and submitted it and sent it over to tufts and it went ignored it went ignored and this happens all the time in nutrition Dang. bro that's why it's all a freaking house of cards. And I think we're, we're, we have like real problems, you yeah. know, like it's, it's no wonder people are so sick and are so confused and don't know who to trust. Yeah. It makes sense. And this, and, and the, and it comes from within science. Yeah. I mean, I could, I could throughout history, there have been other like this, like amyloid thing that we were talking about, which is, which is so awful, so terrible. It's not, I mean, it's like just one of, of many examples. Like there was that case of, um, I don't know if you guys remember, but this was like an expose that was revealed years ago where the Sugar Research Foundation yeah. basically paid scientists the equivalent in today's money of $50,000 to place to take all the blame off of cardiovascular disease, take it off of off of uh, sugar and put it on fat and put it onto fat. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> and that was not disclosed in yeah. the pivotal New England Journal of Medicine paper that for decades led to people being afraid of dietary fat, yeah. of saturated fat, right? So, right, I mean, that was, it was it was so corrupt. Yeah. And then there was this other instance of, um, and I actually think it's quite funny, I'm probably the only person that, that gets the nuance of this, but Ansel Keys and yeah. this uh, Sylvain Lesney guy both were, both conducted research at the University of Minnesota. And so Ansel Keys is this guy who for decades is, you know, he's, this he's is the seven country study, seven right? country study, which yeah. was really the 22 country study, but he conveniently left off all oh, the yeah. countries that picked. happened to eat high fat and had low incidence of heart disease. But he was, this is what you see over and over again with this Lesney guy, with this, um, with, uh, Ansel Keys, you see the same kind of descriptors used over and over again, like obstinate outsized personality, highly charismatic. And in a sea of scientists, if you've got even like uh, an iota of charisma, <laughs> you stand out. you're going places, right? <laughs> yeah. So, so, so that's the, that was the case for this Ansel Keys guy who, you know, many people trace back to being the reason why we've become, we've been so scared of, of dietary fat and saturated fat in, in particular. It became national policy for decades because of his yeah. fake study because of his fake study and so one of his the, the pivotal studies that he set out to prove the diet heart hypothesis right that dietary saturated fat increases risk for cardiovascular disease was called the minnesota coronary experiment where they took these prisoners <laughs> right and they randomized them to either being a, on a on the what was the equivalent of the standard american diet at the time i think it was like 18 percent saturated fat in their diets and then the control that they slashed the saturated fat in half and they gave them all this like corn oil yeah. fortified crap food, right? There was like, uh, I think what the, the findings at the time was there was no difference or something. So it was like essentially a null yeah. result. But 30 years later, yeah. they found the data. They, re, they found the data in a basement somewhere. They reanalyzed it and they found that the corn oil, the people on the intervention diet, the corn oil diet were having dramatically more incidence of heart disease, heart attacks, yeah. cancer, and things like that. You know, right? what's interesting about that is they even said, if I'm not mistaken, it was that study where they said, oh, the corn oil, vegetable oil, people, they, we saw a reduction in cholesterol. Yeah. And that's how, they, that's how they advertise it. Like, oh, right. it, it works. Reduction in cholesterol. But again, like the, right, like the reduction in amyloid, yes. right? Yeah. If you're reducing cholesterol, but you're not actually reducing rates of heart attacks, then what the fuck are you doing? Yeah. What's the point? The shitty What's part the is how how long it takes to steer this ship too. Because once you set it in motion on that direction, I mean, you still, I mean, you guys still come. I still come across people that think that you know butter, saturated yeah. fat, things like that is like the is it, the devil. Margarine's the, yeah. the way to go. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that's how long it takes. That's been we've known that's a bunch of bullshit for quite some time now, but it still takes that long the, you to know, steer it back. So the method of science is objective, uh, but the people that that advertise it, talk about it, use it. Human beings are corruptible. That use it. Those are the ones that could be corrupt. And science, I never thought I'd see the day, Max, where diets would become politicized. I never thought I'd see the day. Like, how can you politicize a diet? How can a political party use a diet in a way to advance their cause? 
And now we're seeing that. Well, because exactly. somebody yeah. smart quickly realized how closely related it is to religion. Oh. I mean, diet and religion are so closely related. I mean, because it's part—it's a part of who you are. Yes. And and now I'm seeing there was an article. See the article in Scientific American how eating too much protein can make your urine. Oh, I saw that. <laughs> bad for the climate. Okay. Yeah. My natural pee is bad for the environment. <laughs> yeah. Get the fuck out of here. Yeah. I gotta be scared of my pee yeah, now. I mean, uh, and you've you've been on the other end of this, like how politicized the diet is. Uh, diets have become. Um, I know you've even been attack because you've said things like ah, meat's actually quite nutritious yeah it's super nutritious i mean this guy one of the uh papers that i love to cite from from ty Buell, um and you know there are other papers he's not the only researcher nutrition researcher but animal products are the most nutrient dense foods that we have access to there was a paper that came out where it was basically listed all of the foods that are the highest in terms of their concentration of um, not just any nutrient, but like nutrients of concern, nutrients that tend to be under consumed. And it was all, with the exception of dark leafy greens at the top, it was all animal products. It was like liver, eggs, milk products and things like that. And yet these foods continue to be demonized. Yeah. I'm not a, a conspiracy theorist, but you know, it's, it's hard not to believe that somebody somewhere isn't like, yeah, it's keeping them weak. You know, it's like, <laughs> it's like well, you're in my I, real house. Now. I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't have believed you had I not seen articles, which people share with me now over the last couple of years. So I never saw articles like this before, but I've had people share me articles, literally, um, why lifting weights is, is contributing to toxic masculinity <laughs> Mm -hmm. or um, why trying to become to fit -right, uh, is thinking. body shaming and, it, you know, and, you know, why, yeah, alt-right, you know, flourishes in fitness communities. And I remember, I, I see these articles, I'm like, oh my God, yeah. are they going to try to politicize He's weaponizing this fitness? Well, good luck, first of all. The reason why I say good luck is because it's, you can politicize anything, but people who are really into fitness, and I don't care where you where you start from. I'm fat. I'm skinny. I don't look good. I want to look sexy for the beach. Whatever. If you pursue it long enough, it's such a, a personal growth vehicle that once you experience it, you do it for five years, ten years. You try attacking it, and it's like, no, man, it doesn't work that way. Like, yeah. I, like I've been in gyms for ten years, and they're the most accepting places on earth for obese people. Where, where as some of these articles say. Don't go to gyms. It's, you know, they're going to body shame you. You will, the, the last place you'll get body shamed if you're obese is when you go to the gym and work out. That's when people are working out and they see you and they go, oh my God, it's so awesome you're here. Let me help you out. Or do you have any questions or high five you? This is really, really crazy. Really yeah. crazy to me. So, okay. So people listening to this. And so here's my fear. My fear is with all this stuff that's coming out that now people are like, I don't believe anything. Yeah. Cynicism you know? through the roof. Yeah. I don't believe anything. I don't know who to believe. I'll just, you know, whatever, which I don't think that's good either. Are there good kind of directing principles that people can look for when they read a study? Like, what do they look at? Um, you know, things like controls and, or what about meta analysis? Like, what are things that you look for in studies that make you go, okay, this, I think this is good. This is a good direction. Or, ooh, I don't really know if I like this study. You know, it's, re it's really hard to say because, I mean, I would say go to the meta analyses, but even meta analyses can be poorly done based on what their inclusion exclusion criteria is, right? Okay. So you can, you can do a study to, to prove any point that you're trying to make. Um, I, that's why I think, I mean, my mantra has always been evidence based, but not evidence bound. I think it's super important to, um, still use common sense and to, uh, and to be able to think through the lens of evolution. Like what, what, Ooh, I like that. Yeah. Like what, what would have made sense for my ancestors? You know, I think that the less time, for example, a food product or a, or a medicine or a supplement has spent in circulation, um, the greater scrutiny, um, mm -hmm. and skepticism we should have when assessing whether or not it's going to be right for us. I mean, a, a great example of that are the grain and seed oils. You know, I get a lot of flack sometimes online yeah. for steering people away from grain and seed oils because the nutritional and the medical orthodoxy still loves them. And it is hard to find human outcome data that they that they are acutely harmful, right? But these are novel foods. Like they didn't exist in the in the human food supply prior to 100 years ago. And so suddenly we think that that this is somehow going to be a better alternative for us than something that our ancestors have consumed. I mean, I know that there's the appeal to nature fallacy and I know that yeah. what's natural isn't always better for us. Like that's that should be a given at this point. That's not what I'm saying, but um, but a novel food like this, you know, especially when we have ample animal research, um, we have mechan mechan me mechanistic data that would suggest that these are not ideal for us. All of the um, human outcome data is short term and equivocal. It's not it's not like overwhelmingly positive in favor of seed mm -hmm. oils. And then you could look at parts of the world like um, in Israel. Israel is actually 
they uh, they have what's called the Israeli paradox. They are the top seed oil consumers in the world. They consume about almost 10% uh, more um, of the by calories of these seed oils than we do here in the U.S. And they're not a picture of cardiovascular health. They have higher rates of cancer. Mm-hmm. Um, they have all the obesity, all the type 2 diabetes. And so it's a big problem. It's, it's an experiment that, you know, we don't really know the true outcome of. Well, it's, it's co-evolution. This is the part, this is why what you're saying is so true because, for example, let's just say we didn't know what the sun was. We never were on the sun. And scientists went and studied the radiation from the sun. The, the message would be, don't go outside. This will kill you, right? But now the reason why the sun doesn't kill us and why we need it is because we evolved with it. Yeah. The sun was here before we were. So we evolved with the sun. So the foods that we've eaten for thousands and thousands of years, we evolved alongside those foods, meaning we've become either dependent on them or those of us that didn't process them well, those of us that had intolerances to meat probably didn't survive. And those that did well with it, you know, thrived and had offspring. This is over the course of thousands and thousands of years. So I like the the lens of evolution. I also like to use ancient practices or ancient health practices, not because I think they're the answer to everything, but because they've been around longer. And so I'll sometimes look at like Chinese medicine or Ayurvedic medicine and see what they use. And it's like, how long have they been using that? Oh, they've been using that for a thousand years. And they say it's good for anxiety. There might be something there. That's a long time for them to say something is effective, right? A thousand years. Like how many pe- millions and millions of people have used it over that period of time? Do you ever do that where you look at, at these different arenas and try and find clues or answers? Yeah. I mean, I think I think there is a lot of wisdom to be gleaned from these like ancient traditions, whether it's Ayurvedic medicine or Chinese medicine. And, you know, sometimes you'll see you'll get data about various compounds and other times you won't. Um you know, I think it's good to sort of have a foot and, and be rooted in, in science and the available data. I think it's, you know, we, I think that the, the way to encourage science being performed better is not to opt out of science entirely. We need science. I'm not anti-science in any way. Um, but, you know, I just think that like, it's a shame that we don't get better, better data on these kinds of compounds. Like for example, uh, what is that supplement that I took? Ashwagandha. Yeah. You know, it's like an anti-stress. I mean, it would be great to have the 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 level of evidence that we have for something like that that we do for something like Prozac. But unfortunately, it's like you can't patent, you know. No, unless they figure out the active ingredient and then synthesize it and change it a little bit. Yeah, right, like a proprietary proprietary formula. But yeah, I think I think the evolutionary lens... I think it's I think it's important, you know. Uh, it's like I, you know I want to eat whole foods primarily, um, and uh, and avoid the foods of modernity, in hopes of potentially avoiding the diseases of modernity. You know the dis- diseases of civilization. I mean, rates of Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, like all these kinds of conditions, they're they're increasing, they're accelerating. Autoimmune issues. Yeah, autoimmune issues. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean it's it's hard not to point the finger at the modern. When you first got into the space. Uh, and your intentions were, oh man, I just want to help people. Um, and you wrote your first book. It's when we first had you on the show. Great book. Then you wrote the second one. And, and all your books are amazing. And you genuinely want to help people. You genuinely have these great intentions, good intentions. Were you shocked or blown away that you would actually have people coming after you? Not to say, hey, I have you know, you know, know, information that's maybe different, but rather trying to attack you <laughs> like you were... <laughs> Like you were running for, you know, public office or something. Like they yeah. need to throw mud at you. Was that? Was that? I remember when. I, I'm gonna. I'm not, I'm not gonna get, go into details, but I remember text messages from you, <laughs> where you'd send them to me. Like, what, this is the weirdest thing. Why are these people coming after yeah. me? Yeah, yeah. Where's all this hate coming? Yeah. From? That, did you have any idea that would happen? I get. You know, I get a lot from the vegans just because I take a, an unapologetic approach to promoting animal products. Um, but I also promote whole plants. So it's like you know, the carnivores come after me too. <laughs> uh, and then I get attacked by. You know, sometimes like the quote unquote evidence based people on on social media, but actually some of the, they're like when you look at them, the, first of all, the, the the advice that they often peddle is among the worst out there and they tend not to look very healthy either. Oh. I mean, the last person I want to take nutrition advice from is a nutrition expert on social media, <laughs> ironically, right? <laughs> like some of these and I'm not, I'm not talking about anybody in, in, in specific here, but like, you know, a lot of the like nutrition PhDs and and. Um, you know, the, the dietitians, like the, it's some of the worst information that you'll see, you know, like this, like all foods fit mantra, oh, yeah. um, 
you know, the idea that really calories are all that matter, which I know that you guys talk about all the time. So I don't want to be dead, beat a dead horse, but it's, um, it's like this really sort of like reductionist, uh, and simplistic approach to nutrition that like, I don't really know who it's serving, you know, like some, sometimes you'll see these like food scientists that they're, it seems like their whole brand is to, um, is to really shoot down what I think is the warranted skepticism that people have around food additives and about, yeah. um, chemicals that they're exposed to in their environment. You know, they'll say things like everything is a chemical, you know, <laughs> yeah. to the mom who's afraid of exposing their baby to some kind of industrial freaking chemical that's only been sort of in, you know, human circulation for the past like 20 or so years. I think, I think they're, yeah. I want to believe their intentions are pure. Like, I don't think they're all malicious, right? I think what they're trying to do is distill it down to what they think is the, the biggest rock and think that like, we're not going to be able to convince all these people to look deeper at their foods and like, and so let's just give them the most, the biggest thing, which is if you just eat less calories than you, than you burn every day, you'll be yeah, exponentially sell- healthier. And so they, they try and stay focused on that and then everything else they want to dismiss because it's too overwhelming for the majority. And so I think that's the logic that that, you'd that hope promotes so. that message. You'd hope I, so. But they don't sell it that way. They no. don't. They don't sell it that way, that way. and they, I think they deliver it poorly. But I, I I can think of a lot of these people that present that message, and I know some of them, and I know that they they don't have malicious malicious intent. I think quite a few of them get a little bit of the God complex because they're educated and they're smart and they know yeah. how to read studies. And so, and they think they know what's best or the best way to communicate it. But I think the part that they miss big time and that we try, we all here try and communicate is the behavioral aspect. And I think that that's the piece that's missing in this conversation. A lot of times is like, you know, when you, when you tell somebody it's just a, a just calories. And if that person, it, cause you technically, if your body burns 2000 calories, you absolutely could eat a thousand calories of ice cream every day and potentially still lose weight. But we know what behaviors that leads to later on. And, and the reality that person's going to stay at a thousand calories eating ice cream is not realistic. And so there's a bigger part of the conversation that I think that we're all trying to have all the time with people. And I think people are smart enough to be able to understand that. It's myopic. That's why people get real myopic. And, and, you know, like like artificial sweeteners is one, right? That's a big one that I tend to hammer on. And people are like, oh, but the studies show it's totally safe or whatever. Like, okay, do you taste it? Do you perceive it? It influences your behaviors. It is not innocuous. Mm-hmm. So, and by the way, it does, and now it also comes along with no calories. Do you think that's going to change your behaviors when you're going to get this feeling of the sensation of sweet without calories? And sure enough, you know, someone might drink one Coke, but now it's a diet Coke, so I'll have 15, right? So- it's uh, they don't have the big picture, or at least they're communicating just one small thing. Another example would be a study on an additive, and they say, well, here's a six month study showing that at ten times the concentration that anybody will consume it at, that they'll be you know totally fine. Well, there's two problems with that. One is it's six months, so who knows what it looks like cumulative, cumulative you know over decades and decades, and also. There's a lot of these additives that are in combination. Nobody's studying exactly all yeah. of them together. Like, okay, fine. The chemical in my deodorant has been shown to be safe in some studies. And the chemical in my my plastic container has been shown to be safe in some studies. And then, then the shampoo and then in the food and then the But is there a study combining all these things? None. Yeah. None yeah. of those exist. And over years. None, not, not, none not of that. Six exists. weeks. Yes. You know? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and our worsening chronic health our, our, our chronic health issues and as they continue to worsen tells me we're doing a lot wrong. Yeah. More wrong than we are right. Yeah. Inhabiting the modern world is like swimming in a toxic soup. <laughs> it really is. There was a, an organization called the Endocrine Disruption Exchange that I was, uh, I was sort of friendly with, the, with the, um, one of the main spokespeople for it. And they identified 1,400 compounds that we're exposed to on a daily basis that have oh endocrine God. disrupting potential. It's like disrupting 1,400? The, yeah. <laughs> So we know what one of them may do, but 1,400 combined? Right. Combined, yeah. yeah. They don't know. They're doing these studies with like, you know, with with rats in isolation. Yeah. And the other, like the, the reason why these compounds are so difficult to study in terms of their, their toxicological effects is that they don't have the same linear dose response that that other potentially toxic compounds have, right? Um, yeah, there, sometimes there's a tipping point. In other words, uh, you don't get an effect until you hit this 
high amount, and then you start to see some real negative effects. So if they don't hit that, right, you might not see anything. Well, that's like the dose makes the poison. So that's like typically like you could look at water, you could look at yeah. salt, you could look at literally any compound, and at a given there is a toxic dose, right, for any compound, like for any exposure. But the problem, and that, and that, it's linear essentially. Like with increasing mm -hmm. dose, you get increasing danger. Um, for lack of a better term. But the problem with these endocrine disrupting compounds, we've talked about this in the past, but it's that they have a non-monotonic dose response. So it's not a straight line. It's like a curve. It's like a U oh. where you can get one effect at a certain dose and then at a low dose, you can get a completely different effect. And so that's why it makes these compounds really difficult to study. Wow. Wow. This is this yeah. is crazy. Okay. So um, so let's talk about this this documentary that you, that you worked on and that you've been working on for eight years. Um, you showed me the trailer twice now both times it made me want to cry because it's so powerful so talk about this for a second and what are we doing with this are we are you putting it out there yeah well it's we don't have a, a release plan in place yet but the film is called little empty boxes it used to have another name we did a kickstarter campaign for it and the name was breadhead actually for the that was the name of the documentary and it was called breadhead not because i was pointing a finger at bread and saying bread causes alzheimer's disease but because bread i think is one of it's it's a it's one of these like ultra processed foods that tends to masquerade as like a health food mm. you know it's one of humanity's oldest processed foods but it's a processed food nonetheless and today our diets are dominated by ultra processed foods. I mean, 60% yeah. of the calories that we consume. Actually, one of the first studies, I'm sure you guys would be interested in this, came out looking at the relationship between ultra processed food consumption and dementia risk. Uh, it was published two weeks ago. I saw it. Yeah. For every 10% increase in ultra processed food consumption, 25% increased risk of developing dementia yep. over 10 years. Right? What does that have to do with amyloid? Nothing. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. It's like, what well, it, you know, it's in the food. Yeah. But anyway, so the documentary is called Little Empty Boxes, and it's the first ever dementia prevention film. And we are uh, finishing it up right now. We're submitting it to various film festivals. Hopefully we can get a premiere at one of them. Um, but the footage is, is there's footage. It's, uh, it's your mom is, yeah. a, is a big part of it because she went through it. And there's old footage of you as a child recording. Your, were you always like trying to capture stuff? And Yeah, I've always been. That's actually the, the I think, probably major reason why I go into medicine, which is, you know, something I've always been incredibly passionate about, but I'm also super creative. So I've always been sort of toying around with cameras and, um, yeah. So I've been, I've been, I, I was, I've been essentially filming my mom who passed away three years ago, but I've been filming her since I'm like a little kid, since like a baby. Wow. And, uh, it's funny. Cause like I, you know, I mean, now I know what it was all for, right. It was right, so right. that I can, hmm. so that, you know, the tragedy that was her life. I mean, her life wasn't entirely tragic, but that what, what she endured wasn't in vain, you know, that I can, that I can share her story with others and hopefully inspire them to a greater vision of life. Mm. Well, mm -hmm. God bless you, man. I yeah. hope yeah. this thing crushes. I'm excited for it to come out, man. I'm very excited. Again, you're, you're by far one of our favorite uh, people. Um, I don't want to say my favorite on air because then I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings, <laughs> but you know how we feel about you, man. Sure. Thanks, But brother. no, I appreciate you, man. I really appreciate what you're doing. And um, I mean, uh, interesting time right now, but great time, great timing for you because uh, this has been something you've been preaching for a while now. And now finally news is coming yeah, out that you've been going in the right direction. In that so, right direction. And yeah. this, this is good for humanity because Alzheimer's is a, a modern health crisis. People just don't realize how big of a deal this is. And you said mm -hmm. it, it's a triple. The number of what people with Alzheimer's is going to triple by what, 2030? 2030, yeah. It's less than 10 years. For that, so. Yeah, it's it's crazy. I mean, today, if you make it to the age of 85, you have a 50% chance of being diagnosed. Wow. Yeah, it's wow. crazy. It's crazy. But there are things that you can do. And, you know, I've dedicated my life really to helping people you know, separate fact from fiction and, and help avert these kinds of conditions and cardiovascular disease. Cause you know, that's important when it comes to yeah. the brain. So anybody that wants to do a deeper dive, I I've written three books, but genius foods is my first book. And that's really a, it's like a nutritional care manual for the brain. So anybody wanting to do a, a really thorough dive into the mechanics of brain health and how to, you know, optimize the way that their brains work, both for mental health, as well as risk minimization for these mm -hmm. kinds of conditions great place to start. And then I talk a lot about this stuff on my podcast, the genius life. And we just great had show. you on. Yeah. yeah. yeah I was Thanks, just bro. on there. I've been on there a few times. Good time. Always a good time. Yeah. Thanks, man. Thanks, Max. Thanks, Max. Thanks, Max. Thanks, Max. Appreciate Thanks, it. This one's really important. And that is to phase your training. If somebody trains for a full year doing a bench press and they're always aiming for five reps, if you compared that person to a person who did bench press where they did three or four weeks of five reps, but then they did three or four weeks of 
12 reps and then three or four weeks of, let's say, 15 to 20 reps, and then they'll throw in some supersets. At the end of that year, you're going to see more consistent progress from the person who's moving in and out and less injury.